I was I was laughed upon, you know. As a man that's just got married, you want to support your own wife. You know, you can't go to your dad and turn around and say, can you give me a few pounds and pennies? It makes you a bit of a lesser man. Yeah. So I thought to myself, right, okay, do you know what? I need to earn money myself. Let me just risk it. It's fine, because if you don't take risk in life, if you don't take risk in business, you're never going to make it. Welcome to another episode of the Tire Camel Podcast, the number one platform for sharing stories worth telling. So that's your kind of jam. Make sure you hit that subscribe button. We'll go straight into it, bro. Yeah. Let's do it. For those who haven't come across your content, uh-huh. how would you describe what what you do, bro? Uh, I'm just a born entrepreneur, to be honest with you. I mean, the thing is, you, you, you're never taught to be a businessman in school. It's just something that you're born with. So, how I would describe myself is just uh, a born entrepreneur that loves doing business. Um, maybe I was thrown into it uh, during childhood, uh, but I'm, I'm pretty sure uh, we're going to yeah. probably get into that anyway. 100% bro, I think you're just being humble, man. Yeah, so yeah. I'm going to bring the reality of the situation to the forefront, yeah? Um, because I find it fascinating, bro, because you started from uh, your baby company, which is La Wung, mm-hmm. yeah? And from there, and I mentioned this to you before the podcast started, yeah? Yeah. You know, we know so many modest fashion brands, uh-huh. are buyer shops, you know, people selling thobes, and that's what your company essentially sold right yeah. in the beginning. Um, but no one has taken it out of the local bubble like you have. So for example, to give people the context, yeah? Uh, your company now has over 127 franchises. You have diversified into medical supplies, providing multiple government schools with uniforms, and even supplying the military with outerwear. Mm. Am I right in saying that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fine. Mashallah. So, you know, I don't want to downgrade what you do, bro. Plus, you're in the process of uh, building a golden tower in Manchester. Yeah, yeah. We've got planning on that site. But again, we can probably talk about that later on. Um, but going back to your original question in relation yeah. to the Arabian brand. Um, it, it, I mean... The way I looked at the Arabian industry when it came to Thorbes was there was only two companies that were out there at the final seal. It was really boring. You know, it was just a long dress and that was it. So you, say, for example, you're working at a, a council office or DWP or um, a call centre, whatever it is, and you want to wear a Thorpe, it becomes laughable because people will look at you and think, look at this dude, man, he's just wearing a long dress. So I seen a niche in the market and that was an opening. That opening was, why can't the, the West fuse with the East? So it can be a shirt and it can also be a thorb at the same time. Right. So the idea that I had, and uh, I'm sure we'll probably come into it, the reason why I did it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I got pushed into, um, uh, you know, making a little bit of money, which I had to do. I had no other choice but to do that. Yeah. And then I started, um, you know, getting some fabric coming into my mother, doing the design work, uh, taking it back to boarding school and saying, look, would you buy this off me? And yeah. I just started selling it to students and it became really popular. Amazing, man. Um, We're definitely going to get into the details because the people want to see a blueprint yeah. of how to break out that local bubble uh-huh. uh, and, you know, hopefully one day tie that camel. Yeah. And you know, or start the process of becoming financially independent. Do you know what I mean? Uh-huh. Um, and hope we can, you know, do that today's podcast. But before we get into the details, yeah, every success story has a backstory. Uh-huh. So I think it's only appropriate, bro, that we take it all the way back to the beginning because despite your success now, uh-huh. you not had it easy, bro. Do yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. So what, what was your childhood and upbringing like, for example? Um... I, th- I think, again, um, every entrepreneur has some sort of backstory and most of their backstory, most of their reason why they went into business is because they've had it hard, you know. And I look at my children today yeah, and I can't drive it into them as much as I could possibly want to because they've had a very luxurious lifestyle yeah you know so i i, I turn around and there's this you know you try to relate with your children so i turn around and i say right this is what your dad went through and this is what made me yeah. it's not their fault because i'm trying to push my eldest into business right now and he's a he's a fantastic entrepreneur how old is he he's 16 16 but he does not have the drive that i did and he's yeah. never going to have that drive because if we take it all the way back mm. um, um, I mean I'm half half Indian and a half Burmese um, that's an interesting mix by the way <laughs> <laughs> and and 
Um, when you have a little bit of colour, you just kind of just frowned upon. And also with, with the Indian community, um, there's there's two kind of sectors. We, we have the Baruchi community, we have the Sulti community. And because I'm a Sulti, uh, the Sultis were also picked on. So you, you've got your half Burmese and you've got your Sulti community as well. Right. So going to mosque, becoming a Hafiz, um, you know, there, there was obviously a bullying aspect to all of that. Right. But it all depends on a person's mentality, you see. Yeah. So I know right now in today's society, we kind of sugarcoat everything that's going on in relation to bullying, in relation to mental awareness. And we kind of give a, a very comforting arm or um, a, a hug and turn around and say, don't worry, everything will be fine. And I think that's wrong. I really do think it's wrong. And that goes back to what you're saying about your son, you know, bring to light that it's not going to be easy. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course, because if you're never going to go through hardships in life, yeah, right, um, and when you do go through hardship, because sometimes in life you will have a downfall, you will do. Mm. It's never going to be on an incline. You have, you'll have an incline, you'll have a stability, and you'll do, definitely will have some sort of decline, right? Yeah. And when you're on a decline, you'll never know how to cope with it if you've never gone through any form of hardship. Mm. But the question comes then, how do you instill that in your son? That, that's only life experience. You can't really... Look, uh, uh, look, think uh, about it. If you tell your son, I'm guessing it's going to go in one ear, yeah. come out the other. Yeah, I mean, the th I'm not going to say I rule with, I rule with an iron fist, but I am very, very firm at right. home. And the thing is, I have a lot of conversation with my children. I do. Yeah. Right? Even yesterday we went out, we went ice skating and stuff. And on the way back home, I told my six-year-olds, oh, I didn't hear you say Jazakallah. Mm. or even thank you, or even show some sort of gratitude or gratefulness towards your parents. And they're six years old, so right. sometimes they don't understand, yeah. right? But I drive it into them at that age, right? And I, and I explained to them, I said, look what dad's done for you from this morning, regardless of any other days I'm talking about this morning. Mm. Dad went out, dad got you breakfast, dad made you breakfast, mm. you, know, you know, bring the other car back in, go to Manchester, drive them down, take them to this place, take them to that place. Mm. And my son was sat there as well. Right, and I said to him, I said, whatever you're gonna earn in a week, I've spent in a few hours just on you guys. Mm. Yeah, right. So just imagine you did that for yeah. your own family, right? And your son doesn't say thank you to you at the end of it. How would you feel? You know, and he goes, you know what, Dad, yeah. I'm really sorry. Right. And then you give a, you know, he gives you a hug and stuff and gratefulness. So all of that comes into play. And the thing is, children forget every day. Mm. Like my four-year-old woke up this morning, right? She must have said Jazakallah to me about 10 times yesterday. And she <laughs> said the first thing, first thing that she said to me this morning yeah. was Jazakallah. And it works, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, because if you look at schools as well, yeah, it's exactly the same. If you look at Madrasa, it's exactly the same. In our days, we only had first, second or third. And mm. that was it. You had to work extremely, extremely hard to come first, second or third. But now everyone bloody gets a merit. Yeah, you know, even a person that comes last gets a merit Get a for trying for hard, com competing in sports as well. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and and I think that is the downfall in today's society. It, it really is. It takes away the competitive edge, right? Hundred percent. Yeah. Hundred yeah. percent. I mean, I go to China quite a lot, and they've still got the military mindset. Mm. You know, they still go to two years, three years of military tra training, and they go to boarding school, and that is mandatory. Yeah. Right. So you can't slouch on your chest. You got to sit like this, right? And you know the respect that they give to their teachers. I I, I remember going to. It's, it's embedded in their culture. Hundred yeah, percent. That's, that's what it is. That's yeah. foundational. You got to bed it into your culture. One million man. percent. I mean, yeah. I, we get it from our elders. I remember going to a hospital over in China yeah. and the student doctor, yeah. uh, the trainee, uh, 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 was um, in charge of um, providing tea uh, to the doctor. So she was actually sat behind the doctor, the GP, yeah. and she was just, had the, the cup of tea and was giving tea to the doctor. But this is etiquette yeah. of a student, mm. you know? And, and now it's like the, 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 the GP sat over here, the trainee sat over there, and you've got to be very careful in what you say in front of the trainee. Yeah, yeah, you know, 100%. So. 100%, bro. Well, like, it reminds me of, I don't know why, Eddie Hearn for some reason, because I'm, I like Eddie Hearn because he was born and he's proud of it with a silver spoon in his mouth, right? He talks about it all the time. Yeah. But I, I'm always thinking to myself, how did this guy still have the drive to go out, go out and be, become successful. And he was saying in an interview one day is because of his experience, like when he was younger, people used to always refer him as, oh, he's Barry's son, he's Barry's son. Yeah. Like dismiss him basically. So I'm convinced that obviously that led him to have that drive and fuel yeah, to yeah. 
you know, show people that, you know what, I'm not having it, man. I'm more than Barry's son, right? I'm going to show you guys, do you know what I mean? And I feel like your story is kind of similar in some ways or entrepreneurs in general, um, just to unpack what you said before, you went through certain things about your colour, you know, school was difficult for you. I think, would you say some of those experiences and we can expand on what those experiences are, Yeah, made you have a chip on your shoulder as well saying, do you know what? I'm going to make a success out of myself. Talking about what you just mentioned, Eddie, yeah. Yeah. no man wants any other man to be more successful than him other than a father for yeah. his son. Yeah? Yeah. So right now, and, and, and this is just advice going out to other parents out there because everyone's everyone's got their own little struggles, right? Yeah. So my son um, is a fantastic entrepreneur, but he doesn't have the drive. So it's very easy for me to turn around and say, right, okay, son, you're going to come into business with me and this is what you're going to do. I'm going to give you X amount of money and um, or you tell me an idea that you've got and I can invest into it. Instead, what I've done is, College is not for you because I'm not I'm not pro education as well. So pro mm. ac- like academic education. If you're going to be a, a doctor, a dentist, something that's a professional body, specialized, specialized, go off Fair and enough. do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But you, you go you go drive past the colleges now and the universities. I mean, it, it's a, it's a fashion show. That's all it is. Um, I, I I I mean, I don't know much about Manchester, but you go to you go to Preston, Preston College, you see all the Asians. So Asians will we, we, be sat uh, stood up in their little corners. The white community will be stood up in their corners and stuff. And and it, I, I just feel like there's no education, mm. right? Uh, because these people um, will go go on to universities and post universities, they'd be in debt of around forty eight, fifty thousand pounds. Yeah, yeah. And they'll still be jobless. Yeah. So what is the what is the purpose of education, mm. unless you're going into a specialist field? So I said to my son, I said, listen. Because uh, he, he was always wanted to go to college, but no problem, go to college. And I know you're not going to last more than a couple of months in college. I knew that because I know my son better than he knows himself. Mm. So I said, right, okay, son, no problem, go to college, enjoy it. Yeah. Right. Within two, three weeks, he goes, Dad, I don't, I don't think it's for me. It's not for me. No. Because <laughs> what it is, you know, in high school, you've already chosen your career. Yeah. I know people that have become doctors. I know people that have become, you know, dentists, so on and so forth. And they chose that career from high school. So they knew exactly what they were going to do. If you've not chosen your career yeah, in high school, right, by the time you finish university, you'll still be dead end. Mm. Right. That, that's my that's my theory on it. Right, right. And, and, and it's a proven theory. So I said to my son, I said, listen, Go and enjoy college. Didn't last a couple of weeks, right? And then I said to him, I said, do you know what I think you you should do? Get into an apprenticeship. I know it's difficult, yeah. right? But try your best to get into an apprenticeship because you, you've got both a be- best of both of us and you've got um, education and you've got a source of income and you're in the world of work. Right. Um, you got accepted into a solicitor's firm and it's starting an apprenticeship. Nice. Um, but again, it, you know, if he comes to me after five years, six years and turns around and says, dad, do you know what? I'm a solicitor now. I can set up my own firm, but I want to do things differently. I want to do this, this and that, blah, 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 blah. Then I know he's got the drive because he's learned five years of working on his own. Yeah. You know, he, he did a bit of crypto trading, must have lost, I think, you know, half of Preston lost uh, money on this so-called crypto trade that was fairly notorious. I, I knew it was a Ponzi scheme and it was never going to last. But I thought to myself, do you know what, I'm going to test him. Right, here, son, that's 300 quid. Um, so he put it into the scheme and he goes to me the other day, he goes, Dad, um, I, I've kind of lost that money because it, they're not allowing us to withdraw it. I said, that's fine. I said, you start work next week anyway. Yeah. So I said, your first <laughs> wage is coming to me. Yeah. Because what happens, bro, you ask me about children and how I would instill that into children. Yes. Like if yeah. I could, it's only 300 quid, you know, I, I spend it on toys. It, it, but the reason why I say the prepayment is necessary, then later on what he could very easily do is take money off someone else and not pay him back because he found it easy not to pay someone back. Yeah. So he's got to do it. Plus it, re- it removes that entitlement mentality, right? Yeah, like yeah, I'm yeah. entitled to it, do you know what I mean? Like it's going to come easier as we mentioned before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 100%, yeah. 1 million percent. So I think I think in those days, um, the generation that we were in, I'm pretty certain that you're probably part of the same kind of generation. I'm actually um, neighbours to you back home, bro. I'm right. from Bangladesh. All right, okay, okay. Yeah, man. Shout out to the Burmese <laughs> and the Bangladeshis, right? <laughs> I used to travel by I'd be my airlines going to Bangladesh. Honestly, yeah. you must have broke down three times. Oh my God, there. yeah. Um, Plus our culture has, has an overlap, I would assume, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
yeah, yeah, man. Yeah. So let's go straight into the juicy topic, yeah? Let's go straight into your business. We talked about in the intro, like how you took a uh, modest fashion brand, yeah? Yeah. Um, you know, you specifically selling Thobes. Yeah. Um, and diversified it into, you know, a multi-million pound company. So right. we'll get into the start of that and how you basically did that. Can you walk me through the entire process of how you actually started the business um, and then we'll, we'll follow a little timeline on how you expanded it and diversified into other avenues like, you know, supplying for schools, the military, etc., so on and so forth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, of course. So um, following on from uh, from boarding school, Yeah. Um, so I got thrown straight into the deep end. Like I said, I got married. I didn't have a pot to piss in. Yeah. Um, nothing to my name whatsoever. With all the experience I accumulated during my childhood, I thought to myself, okay, what can I do right now? And uh, I saw an issue in the market. So what I what I saw was, I'm in boarding school, I'm still in boarding school, what can I do? Like everyone was wearing thobes. I thought this is fairly boring. Let's spice it up a little bit. West meets it meets East. So I started designing Thorbs, giving fabric to my mom. She used to tailor a few items for me. I used to wear it first, advertise it. And then students were like, oh, that's different, man. In fact, to be honest with you, my teachers used to ask me as well. So I used to use the teachers as a, as a platform of advertisement marketing. Right. It's like celebrity endorsements. Yeah. So now the teachers are wearing it. If the teachers wearing it, the students want to wear it. You know, um, so we had uh, we had a certain period where I was I was printing my own bags, bringing it into um, you know into boarding school and selling it to fellow students. Right. Um, I was doing all right. I was I was putting food on the table because that was that was my goal. You know, because I was never I never really wanted to rely on my father. You know, yeah. and I, because look, as a man that's just got married, you want to support your own wife. You know, you can't go to your dad and turn around and say, "Can you give me a few pounds and pennies?" Um, so I can buy um, my wife this, this and that. It makes you a bit of a lesser man. Yeah. So I thought to myself, right, okay, do you know what? I need to earn money myself. And my my wife, bless her, man, she's not materialistic anyway. She didn't expect a world from me. Right. And this is a conversation that I had with a, a you know, friend of mine playing football as well. And I said to him, I said, look, it's such a beautiful thing that when you get married, you get married into hardship. And I know you're going to look at me and think, what the fuck is he talking about? Mm. Like, what do you mean getting married into hardship? But that's what makes a couple, no? Yeah, yeah, yeah 100%. You, you know, it's what creates building blocks. Um, and, and then no matter what happens in life, yeah, you're always going to go through it. I know people that have had divorces because financial situations have changed. Bro, financial situations have changed so they've had a divorce. Yeah. You know, uh, I've had, um, you know, certain friends that have uh, had divorces because the, the medical situations uh, change. You yeah. know, one person's fallen in, so the other person says, sorry, I can't look after him. I want a divorce instead. Bro, what world do we live in? Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, what I had happen was, uh, I got thrown into deep end, and that's exactly what I did. Um, supplying students with thobs. I mean, we're not we're not talking supplying thousands or you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. So, like half a dozen dozen. Oh. Even though I was just giving two thobs to fellow students, yeah. you know, it, I used to bring it in a bag, and it was printed, you know, and then it had a little sticky label on it and stuff. Uh, but it, the whole packaging probably cost me more than the actual thob itself. Because back then there was no social media then, so that no. was your marketing strategy, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? So the experience. I had to, I had to get the name Loang out there. The thing is, as I mentioned to you, I used to give it to to the teachers. Yeah. And the teachers, when they're carrying that, all the other two students are looking at it. Right. You know, like I said, to celebrity endorsements, you know, that yeah. it happens today as well. So teachers are walking away with it. The students want it as well. Uh, so I had, a, I had a, the demand just grew stronger and stronger. And I said to myself, I said, right, do you know what I'm going to do? Yeah. I'm going to go to China. Uh, and I'm gonna mass manufacture this now and scale it up because there was a graduation graduation uh, ceremony. Right. Um, so there's gonna be a few hundred people coming out. Now, my mother didn't have the capacity to manufacture a few hundred people, uh, right. a few hundred items. So then I um, went to different family members asking for money, um, you know, just to borrow some money, uh, you know, for a trip over to China. Um, look, it, it didn't end very successfully because no one would, you know, support me. Because again, I didn't want to go to my parents and say, parents, you know, can you lend me some money? I thought, let me go to my uncle's or let me go to this relative, let me go to that relative and get a few hundred from him, get a few hundred from him. But bro, I ended up with nothing. Mm. 
Yeah, no one gave me any money. I, I think at the end, my, my, my grandmother lent me some money. I took a flight across to China um, and I visited, it must have been about a dozen factories. Every one of them turned around so and said So this was no. before Alibaba and stuff like that, oh, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Alibaba and AliExpress and all of these online didn't even exist, bro. Right, so you, you had know? to physically go down. Yeah, you had to physically and go your down. your intention was what? I'm going to order 100 units. Yeah, 100 units. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was right. it. Yeah, and so you wanted to physically go out units. there and find a manufacturer. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, see, if anyone's, if you've never been to China, yeah. right, all I can say is a different planet, never mind yeah. a different country. It's yeah. a different planet, bro. You, you go to China and you, you know, you, everything's just, wow, what the hell is this, you know? Um, and I think people have, Chinese have started to pick up the English language a lot more. But when I went first time, I was drawing pictures, like, you know, a picture of a hotel uh, or a house, sorry, uh, just just to say that, look, can you take me to this hotel, picture of a car and a house, and like, I need to get to this destination. That was like going to the hotel. Right, you right, know? right. There, there wasn't like phones where you could use translation services and stuff like that. You used to, the, the way it worked is you had an interpreter, Right. But I couldn't afford an interpreter. interpreter. Right, so right. So I didn't have one, you know. So I went to all these different factories and... On the space of how long? A week? Three uh, days? It was, it, was, it was about, I think, maximum seven days. Seven days? Yeah, seven days. That was it. Seven days. But don't forget, you got two days of travel. So I was only there for about five days. Mm. You know, seven days. Yeah, a day, it, took, it takes a day to get there and a day to get back. Yeah. So five days. So you, spent. you must have took a sample with you. This is what I want to do here. Yeah. So my mum uh, my mum drew up some samples. Yeah. Right. And these are the three samples that I want. Can you manufacture these three samples? Yeah. Uh, but I need it. Uh, I need a hundred pieces. I need um, you know six different sizes. And they just look at me thinking this guy's cuckoo. Right. You know it, 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 what what does he expect? Three pieces, two pieces. I mean you know go piss off. Yeah. Yeah. You know. And it, I was I was I was laughed upon. You know. Um, until the last guy that I visited. Um, call me when I was on my way back to the UK. I was catching a taxi back and um, he called me uh, and he said, come back and see me again. Obviously, I didn't understand the word he was saying, so mm. the taxi driver was interpreting for me. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I said to the taxi guy, I said, but what do you think I should do? And he goes, well, just do what your heart tells you to do. You know, do a picture of a heart. Yeah. And he goes, you know, <laughs> that's, you know. But th this is the way I was communicating. Yeah. Um, and I thought, Tim, let me just risk it. It's fine, because if you don't take risk in life, if you don't take risk in business, mm. you're never going to make it, mm. right? And, and uh, you know what, it's, it's um, calculated risk as well at the same time. You're not, you're not just going to gamble away not all your money. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I thought to myself, right, okay, what's the worst that could happen? Right, I lose my flight, it's going to cost me more money. I go back, I get a job and I pay back. Yeah, that's my worst case scenario, because that's what I look at, always worst case scenario. Anyway, I went back to, uh, to see him. Fast forward now, many years. Um, he works for me, still works for me. At that time, he owned a factory. I actually own the factory now. Um, we've got about 700 tailors there, and he manages everything. Uh, absolutely brilliant fella, gem of a guy. Yeah. Uh, the only thing missing is he doesn't have the he uh, to become a Muslim. But bro, he's got more etiquette and more respect than a lot of Muslims out there. I've had so many people go out there um, that I've supported and helped because they've got no infrastructure there, and they've just tried to employ him. You right. know, and he. Yeah, I've I've had people go to China and they've wanted. To go to the nightclubs and stuff and he'd sit outside yeah. park outside uh until they come out and then he'd teach them about the quran he'll teach them you know he'll get the quran and go so oh, this quran, guy not muslim this guy is not muslim and they say islam doesn't teach you x y and z you know yeah okay, um, yeah so wait hold on a second bro because you just skipped a huge chunk from me man on, do you know what i mean so bloody hell so like yeah i get like you went there um, you formed a wicked relationship with him, yeah. kicked off, it's meant to be, do you know what I mean? Um, yeah, fast forward today, mashallah, you're doing very well, diversified. He's a good link in China, I'm assuming. Yeah. But I want to know that gap, bro. I want to close that gap for the people. Go on. I want to know the details, like what happened. So you've, he agreed to manufacture what, 100, right? Yeah. So okay. He, yeah. So you've come back. What was your next, let's say, let's simplify it. What was your next five moves from there? What did you concentrate on? Marketing, product design? Distribution, no, the scaling. Product, the product wow. design, what was the next five moves? Okay, so product design was already done. So I knew these okay. three styles I've got to bring in. Very simple styles, but different, right? Yeah. And then I thought to myself, let me go further in fabrics. So yeah. I've got a crease-resistant fabric. Right. Yeah, never been done before. I've got a crease. Do you know what? The amazing thing is, this was about 20 years ago now. Yeah. You still get people wearing 
that specific item. Right. It still lasted. In fact, if you want to hear something, story, um, there was an item that we manufactured 17 years ago. Yeah. There was a customer that called, and I don't know whether there was something wrong with the customer or, or he's got some illness or whatever it is, but he said he brought a product 17 years ago and a couple of the buttons fell out and he wanted a refund after 17 years, oh. right? And he's ringing the office like oh, 50 times a day. Yeah, and then the it's team's a bit like, much, isn't it? <laughs> ah, bro, and then I, I've got to ring the customer back uh, because oh. the team's like, we can't handle this fella. So I ring him back. I said, look, brother, you, you purchased it 16 years ago. Yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> what do you expect me to do? Because it should have a lifetime guarantee. But, like, but these are clothing. Mm. Like, you, you've worn the actual product. Yeah, you've rinsed the hell out of it. You, you probably put the buttons on a thousand times. Of course, it's going to fall out. Yeah. You know, but at the end of the day, I gave him a complimentary product. Yeah. But after 16 years, I shouldn't be doing that. You know, 100 percent, man, 100 uh, percent. Yeah. But yeah, just to go back to, um, you, you came back, uh, you had the sample already there, right? Because I want to know step by step the blueprint, bro. Like yeah. how you so, got to where so you are today. So the samples, so the, 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 the samples were already uh, well, well, whilst. Um, uh, on my return, the samples came to me almost within five or six days. Yeah. yeah so the samples, I approved the samples. Yeah. And I said, right, okay, his name's Hwaping. I said to him, I said, Hwaping, can you go ahead and manufacture them now, 100 pieces? Yeah. So the 100 pieces came in. There was a, an ex, uh, not an exhibition, a ceremony, graduation ceremony. It was right. my graduation ceremony. Right, right, right. right. So um, in the graduation ceremony, I didn't really pay attention to me being graduated. Yeah. You know how people do this? You know, like, okay, I'm getting graduated. Let's yeah, party yeah. and stuff. Like, no, you know, this isn't the time for party. This is the time for me to execute my plan yeah. and the plan is right um, there's going to be you know a people coming uh, to the ceremony I'm going to try and sell them these stubs that's right. what I did bro it was a sell out right okay so you sold out there sold out completely yeah smashed it yeah sold Absolutely out completely and uh, to be honest it didn't even take that long I think it sold out in a couple of hours okay so what happened after that then right so in those in those two hours it wasn't just selling to the public we got a lot of shops that came and said I've never seen this product before Right, so we want to, we want you to supply our shop. Right, right. So then I got orders for wholesale. Right, right. right. So I had family members there working for me, but not working for me. They were helping me out because yeah. I couldn't afford to pay them. I'm like, yeah, listen, yeah. bro, can you give me a hand? Like, you know, I've got a stall. Blah blah blah. So what happened was, um, I I was then getting orders via uh, for wholesale, mm -hmm. um, and then I took those orders. So say for example, I I got I can't remember my exact numbers. So hundred uh, products were manufactured for that event. I then got orders for a thousand. Right, right. Yeah. Um, and then those thousand turned to 10,000, then it turned to 20,000, then it turned to 30,000. Do you get me? Over time? Yeah, over time. Okay. Yeah. So, so these, these are shop owners? These are shop owners. That wanted your product in, in their stores? Yeah, correct. Yeah. Right, but okay. But then what I, what I ended up doing is I, I seen that um, a more successful, successful entrepreneurs yeah. um, export out of the United Kingdom. Mm. Because the United Kingdom is a very, very small market. So I, I joined a program called UKTI, UK Trade and Investment. And I think it still exists today as well. Right. Um, so it's a program that you can go to and you learn about exports. Yeah. But I think I did it more of a tick box exercise, you know? Uh, but what can I learn from over here? I think it was like, it was only like a couple of week course. Yeah. Um, at the Barton Grange Hotel. I still remember like it was yesterday, Barton Grange Hotel in, uh, in Preston. Um, so I got that course and I thought, right, I need to export now. But what am I going to do? How am I going to export? Yeah. So there, in France, there's this exhibition called Le Bourget, and about 100,000 people come, uh, if not more than that. To Just the for event. the layman that's watching, what do you mean by export? What does that mean? Export yeah. means to to take your product yeah. from where it is, United yeah. Kingdom, yeah. and distribute it worldwide. So Le Bourget, now the same thing happened in Le Bourget. Uh, it was a it was a, a longer trip, so it wasn't just a day event. It was Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So at the end of Sunday, we hit a turnover of about one hundred forty thousand euros. Wow! Yeah, yeah, so that's how much we made on Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And at that time, I could afford staff as well, so it's fine. I could say, right, okay, come down for three days. I'm going to pay you X amount, hotel, tra transport, everything, expenses paid for. Um, but my job was to pick up more distributors, pick up more wholesalers. That's mm. what I did. So I picked up more wholesalers at that event across France. But it wasn't just France. People were coming in from Germany. People were coming in from Spain. People were coming in from Italy. All across Europe. To this France event. To this event in France, yes. So basically, your business model at the moment, at this event, is people coming to you to take orders. I'm scaling up. You're scaling that's, up. That's what I'm doing. I'm scaling up. So I've so got So when they product. place an order for you, 
Do you go to your guy in China? Of course I did, yeah, yeah. Right, that's what I mean. That's yeah, the business yeah. model. Yeah, so yeah. they come to you, yeah, yeah. place an order, yeah. these shop owners mm. from various sources, various countries. Yeah, yeah. And then once you get the orders, yep. you send it to your guy in China. Yes, yes. And does he ship it to them direct? No, 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 no. Okay. Because I own the company. Right. right. So he was just my manufacturer. But it came to a stage where we scaled up to such a degree that I ended up buying the factory. And I said, right, you come and work for me now. Okay, so you, you end up buying the factory, yeah? Yes. In China? Yeah, in So China. you made a substantial amount of money then, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not even about the money. Yeah. It's never about the money because don't forget, yeah, you, your, your, your manufacturer, your, your, your market growth every year, yeah. 40 to 60%. Yeah. So how are you going to take a profit? Yeah. Yeah. So again, uh, believe it or not, in the years that Luang has existed, I've never actually taken a profit. I can't take a profit. In fact, I've got a, my other businesses that I've set up when, yeah. I, when I started diversifying, had to, um, you know, in, I had to do intercompany loans into Luang just so that I could afford the capital, I, I could af afford the growth. Yeah. Right. So I'll, I'll give you an example, right? So I went to France. Le Boucher, I'm getting 30 wholesale inquiries now, right? But before I was only manufacturing 2,000 pieces. Yeah. Right? Now, all of a sudden during the weekend, I've now got order for 6,000, right. right? If you do the maths in terms of how much each per piece of clothing costs you, how are you going to get the money? So I've had a lot of um, private investors out there that turn around and say, right, okay, I'm going to invest in your company. Uh, I remember very early days, one guy wanted to invest three million pounds into the company. I'm like, no, it's okay. Because I like organic growth, you see. Yeah. So whatever I can afford, and you can speak to any of my retailers out there. So I'm scaling up over, now, over here now, but I can only scale up as much as I can organically. Mm. Yeah. So uh, rather than supplying 6,000 pieces, what I would turn around and say, right, okay, I can't supply you, you know, each, I'm talking each individual yeah, shop yeah, now. Yeah. So say for example, this guy's ordered 400. Yeah. I'm sorry, I can't supply you 400, but I can give you 100. Yeah. yeah. They get pissed off. But at the end of the day, the, the hunger's still there, yeah. right? Yeah. And I'm growing organically. You know what I'm saying? Um, so yeah, we had to do that. And it's a progression throughout many, many years. Okay, and then what sort of systems and processes did you have to put in place to sustain that growth? Like, do you know what I mean? Because that's what kind of keeps the business going. Because now you diversified, right? And we're getting to that diversification yeah, 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 next. Yeah, 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 yeah. But like, do you know what I mean? Like, did you hire, hire staff to deal with certain aspects? I know I'm going like in yeah, 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 yeah. So painful was, detail, but no, no. There was there was a, there was a time where I had um, look. Even now, um, you know, my, my wife always says I'm, I'm a proper workaholic. Yeah. And the thing is, I find I work. I find work challenging. I don't find it stressful at all. Right. Yeah. People turn around. My, my uh, GP turned around and said, "First, you know what? You say you don't find it stressful, but um, you know it, it, it is challenging." and it is taking a strain on your body. So there was a time where I had adrenal exhaustion because I was traveling, you know, with these exhibitions, with these meetings, uh, with these conferences and stuff. Um, I was traveling from country to country every, not even every month, every week. I remember there was, um, there was a time where I set up a clothing brand uh, um, in, in the United States called Wilfred Egbert. So I was doing a magic show uh, in Las Vegas. And then I come back into the UK, uh, which is six or seven hours um, behind. Um, uh, sorry, in front. So we're in front, United States are behind. And then I'd, I'd, I'd spend 24 hours over here and then I'd fly over to China, which are seven hours in front, mm -hmm. you know? So your body clock doesn't have a clue what's going on. Right. Yeah, so you just lose track of time completely. And I remember waking up, um, it might have been in Malaysia in Indonesia, not even China at that time. It was somewhere in Far East Asia anyway. So I remember waking up and it took me a few minutes, I don't forget these few minutes, it seemed like a lifetime, to, to understand where I was. If I, I had to ring reception, they didn't answer from a phone call. I so I, I actually text my wife and I said, babes, I don't have a clue where the fuck I am. Really? No, seriously. Mad. I opened the curtains, I didn't have a clue where I was. Because you're constantly on the go. Yeah, constantly. Oh, no, it's not that. What? Your body clock completely messes up. Yeah. Yeah, so you're telling, your, you're, you're telling yourself your sleep time is at 10 o'clock in the evening. Yeah. Right, one night. Tomorrow is at two o'clock in the morning. The night after that is at seven o'clock in the morning. Yeah, your body just wants to say, right, I've had enough of you. Right. 
you know and so I had adrenal exhaustion and uh, I went through a period of my life where it, it lasted must have been about uh, six months insomnia you know kicked in anxiety kicked in you know uh, and all of this is because certain deficiency in nutrients in the body right all right and uh, the consultant sat down with me because I must have spent thousands on just medical care and he sat down because first take a breather yeah. yeah, take a breath. So when you're talking about having a team around yeah. you, because you're always being in control, it's become so difficult to delegate. So at this level of success, you didn't expand your team. You didn't. No, recruit, no, no. I expanded a team, but I was still working incredibly hard. Right. Because, look, no member of your team yeah. will work as hard as you. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, your team is fed a salary and any businessman will tell you one of the hardest tasks in business is to look after your staff yeah yeah it's 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 like therapy all on its own you know it's very difficult so um it's not about expanding team it's about um they're not working as hard as you you yeah. know if I, i've got a team of designers yeah 10 designers I'd, I, I, there'd be times where I turn around and they'd make 40 samples. I'm like, I don't like that one. I don't like that one. I don't like that one. And then I would physically have to fly across and do all the design myself within a week. You know, so no one, doesn't matter who it is, um, will have. And this is why businessmen try incredibly hard to provide some sort of bonus schemes, to provide some sort of Incentive. you know, incentives for staff to work harder. But listen... Sometimes staff doesn't want incentives. They don't care about bonuses. Yeah. I've sat down with family members and I've turned around and said, listen, why don't you come work for me? You know, and they've turned around and said, oh, I'm happy with my nine to five. No, but I'm going to give you X, Y, and Z. I'm going to give you this and I'm going to give you this bonus. No, I'm not interested. Yeah. You get that. You know, they're what comfortable do do? in it, obviously. They're and then they just want to live their own lives yeah. in it, in yeah, that yeah. sense. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Sometimes I get a flavor of how it built up. I know this is like 20 years ago we're talking about. So mm. yeah, and I'm asking you pain. Stock yeah. in detail, do you know what I mean? I get yeah. it, yeah, do you know what I mean? But the blueprint is basically, look, go to exhibitions, get your brand awareness out there. Yeah, yeah. Um, and hopefully get some potentially orders in. But now with the social media, it's a bit easier with Alibaba, stuff like that. You don't necessarily have yeah, to fly yeah, yeah, out, yeah, yeah, but yeah, you would yeah. recommend going out though, innit? Because I would 110% recommend going out because face-to-face -face is a lot better than doing it over a Zoom call or even messaging or... Because you, you feel the culture. You feel a difference in... Yeah. you know, and, and you might go out there and pick up different business ideas. How did you begin to diversify into other areas then? So, uh, I mean, uh, uh, property developments, for example, right? So yeah. I, I used to buy properties with dividends that was paid off. Um, so I used to turn around and say, right, okay, I'm not going to spend this money. I'm going to save it, accumulate it and buy a property with it, you know? Uh, I, and, and, and the mindset that I had was, there's no point, say, for example, if it's a, a, a £100,000 house, right, I, and, and I got £20,000, I never put it down as a deposit via mortgage. I would rather save up another four or five years and just buy the house outright. You know, that was the concept, the ideology that I had because the interest was haram, riba is haram, end of story. There's no sugar coat in it. There's no covering it. It's haram, yeah? So we look at it and it's not even about being halal and haram, bro. Uh, there's a lot of, I would advise a white community and people that, that, that to take out mortgages as well, not to do it because it puts you in a sentence of its own. Like yeah. you're literally sentenced to it for 20, 25 years. You're never going to get away from it. All you're doing is benefiting the banks and that's it. You know, the banks have put it out there. Look, mortgages is for the poor man. Mm. Yeah. For the poor man to remain poor. Yeah. Yeah. That's what it is. Yeah. The, the, the system will never allow you to educate yourself and become wealthy. Yeah, look, rich men will always, and it's so funny because it's so true, uh, rich men will always try and act poor to remain rich. Yeah, when they say act poor, they won't spend as much money, you know, they scrape and scrounge here and there, blah, 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 blah. But then the poor people will always remain poor because they are trying to act rich. You know, buying the Rolexes that they can't afford, buying the cars that they can't afford, buying the clothing that they can't afford. Yeah. You know, and buying a, a house, uh, a 400, 500,000 pound house that's got incredible amount of monthly repayments, you know, and now all comes crashing down uh, once you, you lose your job, for example. Yeah. You know, you're not financially, um, you know, stable anymore. Uh, because it was never viable to begin with. Yeah. So uh, the idea that I had was right. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna save up the monies that I get. 
don't forget, my, my missus isn't materialistic. It's, I don't spend much money out there anyway, yeah? So I, I, I've got the concept of saving, which, again, young people don't have. So I'm now saving money and I'm buying my first property, buying my second property, buying my third property, buying my fourth property, blah, blah, blah. blah. You're buying them out right then? Buying them out right, yeah. yeah. So... I'm, I'm, I'm now, you know, looking at um, how, and, and, and the other thing is, how am I buying them? Yeah. yeah so, yeah. say if, uh, I used to do certain deals with uh, certain developers and turn around and say, right, okay, I'm going to buy this apartment. Yeah. Or, or, for example, I'll say, I'm going to get you some buyers. Mm. Right? You're going to give me X percentage off. Right. Or if I get you 10 buyers, you're going to give me a free apartment. Right. So that's the way I used to conduct deals as well. Right, okay. You know, with the connects that I had, say for example, I've got now a uh, hundred distributors. Yeah. I speak to some distributors, which I know who are wealthy and they've got some money to spend. I'm like, listen, Adam, for example, or um, Imran or whatever it is, yeah? yeah? I say, how would you want to buy a property in the mm. United Kingdom? Mm. And he's from Tanzania, he's from Africa or whatever, and he's got some money over there. I'm like, yeah, I'm interested in buying a property in the UK. Right, so I've conducted 10 deals now and a developer's now given me a free apartment. Right. Yeah? Yeah. So I'm, I'm accumulating and all unencumbered, but these apartments only complete after two years. Right, right. Oh, I'm there going out and saying, right, okay, I'm going to give you, the, the apartment's worth 100,000, yeah. but I'm going to give you 50,000 pound up front all right, we're going, we're talking a yeah, few yeah, years. Yeah, Manchester's obviously yeah, involved yeah. a lot since then. Yeah. yeah. Right. So I would then pick up um, apartments at a very, very good price because I've taken risk and mm. it's a two year risk. So the developer can go into liquidation and I've lost my 50,000 pounds. Mm. Right. But I've taken that risk and I've gained 50,000 pounds because that apartment's worth 100,000 pounds. Right, right, yeah, right. After two, two and a half, three years, there might be a delay in the bill schedule, whatever it is, it doesn't matter because that's a risk that I've taken, calculated yeah. risk. Um, and then what had happened was um, I, I, I thought to myself, right, okay, if these developers can do uh, what they are doing, then why can't I? Yeah, yeah. Why, why, why can't I source a plot of land? Yeah, and, and, you know, get planning on it and, you know, build a skyscraper. Right. So I thought to myself, um, let me join up with um, a contractor. Let me join up with a real estate tycoon. So I used to conduct, uh, you know, business with uh, Ninox International, not too far from here, a company called Ninox International. And the founding, uh, the person that founded the company was uh, Jeremy Knight. So I said to him, I said, he retired at that time. And I said to him, I said, Jeremy, how would you like to do it all again? So we how, did in, how did you get in contact with him in the first place? I used to buy off him. Right. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so the business dealings. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I said to him, Jeremy, let's do it again. So he goes, oh, because come on, Fez. He goes, I've just retired, and I got. I said, come on, it's a bit boring with him, isn't it? Like, <laughs> let's just do it. You know. So we set up a company called Global Edge International, and we were selling developments uh, for developers exclusively. Then. A, 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 a plot of land um, was proposed to us um, and um, I conducted the deal in terms of negotiations. Uh, we shook hands, we got an option to buy the plot of land, but the COVID happened, you yeah. know, and- Are we I, talking about the Golden Tower, you believe, yeah, right? Yeah, 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 so- The 20 I, million pound- Yeah, it's a 20 million pound tower. So, um, a, a lot of things happened during COVID. It's like the, 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 the profit margins just went from like a, several millions to like a couple of million because the bill cost went up and, you know, uh, partners didn't have the capital to put in for the planning. Um, Manchester's now very aggressive uh, with uh, planning requirements, the conditions and stuff. And then it was just me funding all the planning requirements you know, um, and uh, you know the, the, the directors kind of just turned around and said, right, okay, we can't do it anymore. We haven't got the funding and blah, blah, blah. So I kind of got thrown into the deep end. I tried to build a team out of it and it was a good team, but COVID happened and a lot of companies went under. And I thought to myself, no, I'm still going to pursue. I'm still going to get planning on this site. Yeah. And four years later, I got planning on the site. It was incredibly difficult because it was a, just a short Asian uh, developer who's not done any developments, but, you know, historically before, yeah. and is now wanting to bring Dubai into Manchester, gold-clad building. It was like, you know, unheard of. Mm. And there's a lot of articles out there, a monstrous cladded building, and it's probably the best looking building in Manchester, man. Come on, let's, <laughs> let's be real. Yeah, I like it to be fair. Yeah, you got a lot of criticism for it from like local councillors, isn't it? Laws, laws, yeah. yeah. A lot of the councillors turned around and said, no, we're not having this. I mean, it was all the... Um, you know, I mean, this is where England goes wrong, I reckon, because mm. 
uh, look at look at Dubai. Look what Dubai was 20, 30 years ago. You know, 30 years ago, it's like a desert. Like, yeah. Look at it now. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I remember in, in Preston, where I live, there's a bus station. It was the best bus station in the whole of Europe. And then they wanted to renovate and demolish it. And they spoke about it for five years. You know, and that's where we go wrong. Like, what, what do you want to do? Five years you're talking about. It's like the HS2 coming yeah. into Manchester. Yeah. It's been going on. The dialogue's been going on for years. Yeah, yeah. Right? And, and the Japanese and the Chinese are building cities and metro links. That's probably 10 times as big as United Kingdom. You're still talking about one line coming in from London to Manchester, the HS2. It's like, you know, what, what, what world do we live in? And this is where we're backwards now. Yeah, so this is how you diversified ultimately by building key relationships, yeah, buying yeah. and selling from people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and it's a 20 million pound development, right? It, it's the, the scheme uh, on a gross development value, uh, yeah. GDV to 20 million pound plus, yeah. Okay, and how is that funded in particular? Uh, well, uh, to be honest with you, um, the, the, the way developments are funded is yeah. developers finance. Right. Yeah, so um, I've taken a step back from it because property development is actually not my... Um, Passion. It, it, it's I wouldn't say passion, but it's not it's not something that um, I do on a day to day. You know, it, it yeah, uh, uh, acquiring and acquisitions is, is something different. Yeah, we mm. do that. That's fine. That's no, not a problem because you're building your asset. Um, but there's other things that I find that I can make money and it's more lucrative than property developments because it takes a substantial amount of funding. When you say property finance, what do you, uh, sorry, developers Developer finance. finance. So basically what you do is, um, the way it works is, um, you've got a 20 million pound scheme. Yeah. Your bill cost is 11 million pounds. The banks is gonna fund you 60 to 70% LTV loan to value. Right. Right. Um, so you'd be funding the remainder yourself. Right. Yeah, um, whether it be two million pounds uh, as a as a as a, a forward fund, and then the rest comes in as a developer's finance. So the banks will fund it on a face to face. So they'll face you. You complete one phase, right? They release the second phase of money. You release. You 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 finish the second phase. Right. You release the third phase of money. But they'll get their own independent uh, surveys and QS and whoever uh, the professional body is, the professional team to get that to to come in. And the thing is, if anything goes wrong. Yeah. So it's going to be the banks that's going to win. Right. If anything goes wrong. I mean, the demand's extremely um, popular over here in Manchester right now. 54 apartments is not going to be, it's, it won't take long to sell those amount. I mean, when, we, when we, we're doing Ducey Street right now, it took two weeks to sell 20%. Uh, of the apartments, we had mm. to take it back from the agents. I said, listen, hold on, because the taller you build, the more premium you can get for your apartments, you see? Right, right. Yeah. So ultimately, you, you won't be funding it yourself, ultimately, like putting the 20 million no, in, for no, example. No, no, I mean, no, 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 no one would ever do that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I sit with multi-millionaires that won't even fund their own cars. Yeah, 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 of course. You know, because they get it on finance. Yeah, yeah. Um, Which makes I, sense, which you can die, put your money in or yeah, that Yeah, I mean, I don't really agree with that, because if you, if you're buying a sports car, yeah. right, it's always going to be static in terms of value. Yeah. As long as you don't drive it too much and you don't get it, you know, get too much mileage on it. But I know footballers that will finance the whole of their life. Like, literally everything will be on finance. Yeah. You know, the house will be on finance, the clothing will be on finance, the watches will be on, everything's on finance. You're not about that life. No, I'm not about that life. Because yeah. bottom line is, bro, it is, if things go horribly wrong, yeah. it's going to go horribly wrong. Right. Yeah. And 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 if you're going to be putting the personal guarantees down, um, you're going to lose it. The banks will take it. And banks are there to take your money. Mm. Yeah. They're not there to partner with you. Yeah. They're not there to be your friend. Yeah. They're there to take your money. Yeah. One of the key things I'm seeing with yourself, with your success, is that you're very good at networking. Mm. Um, and you started off with zero contacts, pretty much, right? Zero contacts. Zero yeah. contacts. So, what advice would you give someone who's starting off in the journey of entrepreneurship or business, um, and how to get their you status know, up or network? It, you know, you know, uh, a, a good friend of mine um, who um, represents a lot of the influencers. He's got a talent management company. Yeah. And uh, it took him a while to say this to me. And he goes to me, Fez, I'm very, very afraid of nice people. Mm. And he goes, you're a very nice person, but there's not many people like you. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, people always have their own incentive. The way I work and the advice that I'll give is be nice to everyone, mm. right? And love everyone as opposed to hate. And Allah will put things in place for you. 
Right. Yeah, I, I can't stress that, uh, you know, enough because there's a lot of people that I know out there. Look, I've had loads of people befriend me. And gave me the word, oh, this guy's like this, it's like that, he's done this for me, he's done that for me, you know, putting his arms around me, giving me a kiss on the cheek, and then a few months later, he's there to scam me. Yeah. You know, you get people like that. You really do get people yeah. like that. And that's what this guy actually meant when he said to me, nice people scare right, me. Right, makes sense. Yeah, so what advice that I would give is, you know when you network, people need to buy you first. Right. Yeah, and how do they buy you? By your etiquette, yeah. by your respect, by the way you are, by your mannerism, you know? Like, you might come in and pay for, uh, I've sat with footballers, yeah. uh, I've sat with celebrities, and I'll be paying for people's meals and stuff, but I wouldn't pay on the back of, you owe me one, mm. yeah? I'd pay it because I've been taught right, I'd pay it because of a very famous hadith, afzalu sadaqa and tushbiya kabid and jayin, that the best form of sadaqa is to fill an empty stomach. You know, I took from, I took my family out, my sisters, uh, siblings, and you know my nephew and nieces out yesterday. We spent four, five hundred quid just on food, yeah. And I do that because you know out of the goodness of my heart, not because someone else can turn around and say, "Oh look, he paid for this. Oh look, he's done that. Oh look, he's done that." Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah so be sincere in all your actions, yeah, because your actions, all your intentions depend uh, it, it depends on your actions. You know? So give value without the intention of taking all the time. Yeah. Just give value, 100%. man. Just be genuine, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Genuine. That is the key thing. That is the key thing. There's not many genuine people out there. Yeah, I had a guy on the podcast as well. He said that you know when you're dealing with people, people can sense what's in your heart. Yeah. Do you know what I mean they can sense it? They can sense you yeah. know if you're you got an agenda, and it's true, man. You yeah. can have a sixth sense. We all have a sixth sense. We yeah. can kind of yeah, you yeah. know see what I'm going to a certain degree. There's there's so many people, and I, I, I'm presuming assuming people will be listening into this podcast as well. There's so many celebrities out there and I help them without the, the need of a return. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you know, the funnier thing is, right? When you don't expect a return, the return will always come. Mm. Yeah. And it won't come through that person. It'll come through someone else yeah. because Allah will make that happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah 100%. Yeah, so. And, um, but having said that, okay, let's be pragmatic as well. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Where do you like wealthy people like yourself like to hang out? for an opportunity to network because I know you end up designing for Kanye West and Eddie Murphy yeah. just by being the right place at the right time. Yeah, so yeah, where yeah, do you yeah. like to chill, bro? Let us know. Where do you mind uh, like, is it country clubs? Is it flipping a golf resorts? What is it, bro? Where nah, do you, what, nah, you, what, nah, you, what look, you be doing, man? I've, I've always wanted to play golf, right? Yeah. Uh, and I went with um, a, a friend of mine uh, to Dubai and it was the first time I actually, you know, did a bit of golf in drive range and whatever. Um, it is the place yeah. To communicate and it's a place to network. Really? Yeah, that's where they're isn't full of like older people. No, but the like, thing is these old people are yeah. gems and they are the diamonds in the community because they will tell you how business is properly conducted. Yeah, right, those right, are the people right, right. that have got a million sat in their bank account. Right. Yeah, those are people I've actually made it in life. If you're telling me whether I made it in life, no, I've not, of course I've not. I'm 40 years old, right? And if but you I'm, have made it by 90% of the Well, lost look, uh, whatever I've got in life, yeah. yeah, I would never have dreamt of, put it that way. Bro, no one, if someone like had two lifetimes, they won't achieve, potentially achieve what you've achieved. Do you know what I mean? Alhamdulillah. Yeah, do you know what I mean? But yeah, continue for what you're saying. Yeah, so it's, when I hang out, I, bro, I, I don't really hang out much. Like, yeah. you know, my, my business meetings are proper business meetings. Like yeah. I could meet someone in a coffee shop yeah, and conduct a multi-million pound business meeting. Yeah. Yeah. But most of my business is now conducted via word of mouth. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have a lot of people contacting me saying, can we have a meeting because of this, this, that, blah, blah, blah. blah. And I, I, I was spoke on the last podcast as well. So what I want to do from January 2024 or probably February, because January will probably rush a little bit, um, is to help young entrepreneurs yeah. with businesses, with yeah. business startup. If they've got the drive and they've got the idea and it's innovative, it's niche, right? Um, I have got a full setup in terms of setting up their business for them and offering the, the funding. Right. And I will do that. And that's at a cost or what, what free? Or no, what? no, no, no. That's not at a no cost to that person whatsoever. So we become a shareholder of that company. Right. And then oh, once, okay, once, the, once, the, once the capital is repaid back, then obviously we, 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 we then re-provide the shareholdings back Makes to the company. Makes perfect sense, right. But obviously you're going to dive it. You're going to dissect if it's a good business to invest in the of first course, place. Of course, yeah. There's yeah. a lot of people out there with business ideas. And the thing is, you've got you to you gotta vet the person as well. Yeah. You've got to sit yeah, inside yeah. and the guy's got to sell it to you. It's yeah. a bit like Dragon's Den, isn't it? Yeah. It's a bit like Dragon's Den, but it's worked purely through word of mouth, through social network. And uh, and, and, and I, I will get a lot of inquiries. I know it. I, still, I already am, to be honest with you. Amazing, bro. Um, what I'll do, bro, I'm going to 
end the podcast with a few questions from my Instagram page. Go on, man. Yeah. yeah uh, on. We'll go straight into it, yeah. Um, so, the Put first question. Pot an hour. Uh, yeah. So, the first question is, you own a Ferrari and McLaren and Aston Martin and Lamborghini, among other cars. What's your favourite car you have owned? Uh, you've not mentioned a Bentley Continental GT Jeez. in there. Yeah. Bentley Continental the GT. Bentley Continental GT has got to be one of the best ones purely because it's got speed. Yeah. Right. It's got the wow factor and it's a sports car as well. Other than that, um, again, I might look at cars differently yeah. because you've got to look at retaining value as well. And I think the Lamborghini retains the value better than any one of them right now. Advice for young Muslim on how they can tie their camel and start the process of becoming financially independent. <sighs> Tough one, really financially independent look it, this can be a, an hour conversation yeah but my advice would be and it's the same advice i gave something to my son as well right. um, so what i said to my son and this is i'll give you the response on it is he's going to start working for the law firm and i said to him i said look whatever you're earning yeah. and i broke it down for him is about 11 grand a year as an apprenticeship and stuff and i said you should have seven grand sat in your bank account after all of that after all the expenses and stuff so my advice would be savings One once you've got money, then we can talk. Right. Once you've got money, I said the same thing to my son. I said, once you've got 15, 20,000 pounds, sat in your bank account, we can look at business investment opportunities. So you essentially, so yeah. First step is to save. Yeah, so you're essentially saying, get good with money. Yeah. Yeah, develop money habits. Money management. Live below your means, yeah. develop the habit of saving, etc. then we can talk. Yeah. I like that, I like that actually. Unique answer to be fair. Um, what are some of the biggest mistakes in business you made that people could learn from? Uh, uh, trusting people. Right. But I think I'll continue making that mistake because the way I look at myself is, you know when people trust me with money? Yeah. Or people trust me with advice or people trust me with anything. Uh, the same way I would like to trust other people. And I've trusted a lot of people and I've built myself uh, through the process of trusting other people. Um, so you've just got to do your homework in relation to who you're getting into business with. Yeah. Two part question. When did you make your first 100K? How old was you? And when did you make your first million pound? How old did you? How old was you? I can't remember. Really? <laughs> I can't. Again, I do, what, what it is? Uh, first hundred k, first million quid. Estimate. Give an estimate then. It must have been when you made that hundred forty k in uh, France. Then I take it right. Yeah, that's, that was that, that was a turnover. So you've got to take out. Yeah, you can. You've okay, got to take okay, out your okay. expenses Liquid and 100K. salary and all of that. But probably around that period. Yeah. Probably around that period. So age twenty. Yeah, 20 ish, 22, between 20 and 23. Uh, yeah, but I, I'd extend it to 20 to 25, I reckon, maximum. Right. Yeah. And then um, the, 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 the mill probably, probably 30, I reckon. Yeah, yeah. 30? Yeah, yeah. Liquid? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. Probably, because don't forget, it's an accumulation of property investments, wasn't it? Yeah, that's amazing, that, because um, I think the average millionaire, self made millionaire, is around 42. In the oh, UK. Is it? So Seriously? yeah, you're right, doing well, man. Yeah. About 30. Well done, <laughs> mashallah. Self made, by the way, not inherited or not a form of no, Lego. No, no, no. So Come that's on. good. Um, do you provide a mentorship service? You just answered that question uh, a second ago. Uh, your office looks amazing. Can we have a tour of your office? <laughs> he wants a tour of the office. Which one, where, which country? I have no idea. I'm guessing it's a picture um, that they've seen it online. Um, right. But yeah, Fessel, thank you so much for coming on, man. No I really appreciate your time, bro. It's I been absolutely it. amazing, man. Um, yeah, we'll keep it there, man. Uh, if you like the episode, make sure you hit the subscribe button, like and share. Um, and we'll see you in the next one. Peace.